All right, so let's get, get started with uh, our first GM seminar of the new year. Um, and our speaker today will be Luke Roberts, who is now faculty in cyclotron. And Luke is a computational astrophysicist. And we got his 2018 and 2012 ABC Santa Cruz, where he worked with Sam Newsley. After that, he was an Einstein Fellow in 2012 to 2016 at Caltech, um, before coming here this fall. And Luke has made tremendous contributions to our understanding of things like neutrino emissivities and capacities in the nuclear equation of state, neutron star, neutron star mergers, um, and work lab supernovae as well. Uh, recently, we had the first fully 3D, fully GR. Simulation of quark lab supernovae using multi dimensional neutrino transport ever, and that's yet from match yet. Um, so, really cool stuff. So, thanks. Um, thanks, Sean. Uh, glad to be here both for this talk and at MSU. Uh, so, yeah, Sean mentioned the sort of 3D stuff I've done and some of the stuff about compact object mergers I've worked on. But today, I'm really going to talk about uh, long term quark lab supernovae neutrino signals. So, what happens after a successful explosion and what sort of neutrinos are emitted over maybe the first 100 seconds of the life of a neutron star, or in this case, the total neutron star. Uh, and just, just as, a, as a brief, and these of course come from core collapse supernovae, just as a brief background, I think probably a lot of people have seen the show this slide before, but just to remind you that core collapse supernovae are, are truly multi messenger events. Uh, there's the obvious electromagnetic signal associated with these things, which was, of course, first discovered. It's very, very bright, it's even very far away, uh, very interesting uh, aspects of the, these electromagnetic signals. Uh, there's some possibility of gravitational wave signals from these things, but it would have to be a relatively nearby supernovae. And the exact nature of, of the gravitational wave signal depends on the explo exact explosion mechanism. And so for sort of vertebrae supernovae, this may not be very uh, easy to detect, although one of the galaxies probably can be detected. They obviously leave behind some um, imprint or a very large imprint on nuclear synthesis in our galaxy. So for things like oxygen, uh, alpha elements, but also maybe up to things like dilopium, although I'll we'll talk a little bit more about this today, so I'm going to make a copy of the case. But the main thing I want to talk about today is the neutrinos that come from the interior of these things and what those might tell us about uh, the properties of dense matter and what's going on in this proto neutron star that's formed after the collapse of the massive star. And so, just to, here's sort of the background of what I want to talk about. Uh, here's an overview of what I want to talk about. I mean, this is background uh, on how common these events should be that we detect these things, talk about some basic models of proto neutron star cooling. Uh, and neutrino cooling time scales. Uh, then talk about a couple of things that affect the characteristic time scale of this emission. So, convection inside proto neutron stars and neutrino opacities inside proto neutron stars. And then maybe at the end, depending on how much time is left, talk some about the impact of these neutrinos on nuclear synthesis. And just as a caveat, this is actually a slide from a different meeting where there are a lot of people who are very excited about neutrino oscillations. That I should still mention it here. Uh, I'm not going to talk at all about neutrino oscillations in between the supernova and or in between the proto neutron star and the detector. So that can change the signal somewhat. Although for the proto neutron star phase, the spectra of the different flavors are quite similar. So in that case, you don't expect that oscillations are going to significantly affect what the detector needs to do. So maybe the most important thing to think about is, okay, so neutrinos from a supernova probably can only be detected from supernovae in the local group, and most uh, and, and the most of the number of events would be detected from galactic core collapse supernovae. So if you're going to think about this problem, you might want to think about how often are we going to see these things, and is it really worth it to think about it? And so if you just think about the most obvious thing is, when was the most recent core collapse supernova in a galaxy that we know of? Which is probably a Cass A supernova remnant. That happened about 300 years ago, and that suggests, oh, we haven't seen one since. So maybe, maybe we should be concerned, and maybe you really shouldn't be working on something that happens once every 300 years. <laughs> That's much longer than a human time scale. Uh, uh, maybe a, a little bit more reasonable way to go about this, because supernovae can be obscured by dust in our galaxy and other things. So we're not going to see every supernova that goes off in the Milky Way. And photons, although we would like, we would almost certainly see every supernova in neutrinos, 
Uh, another way is to look at yeah, supernovae and galaxies that are somewhat analogous to the Milky Way. And so this was done by uh, Camillaro et al. in 1999 and some other groups earlier than that. But this is really the latest work on this, so it's not something that people are looking at too much. But if you look at what the rate should be in galaxies that are somewhat similar to uh, the Milky Way, you end up with something like 0.86 SNU, which is a supernova rate unit for a galaxy, or for a uh, 10 to the 10 uh, solar luminosity galaxy, and the Milky Way is about 2.4 times 10 to the 10. So you get a rate of something like maybe 2 per century for these things. And so at 150 years, and not having seen one of these since the 80s, you think, okay, maybe this is more likely than we're going to see. You can also take a census of historical black supernovae and then correct for things like obscuration and look at what rate you would get then. And you also get something that's like a higher rate like this, which is maybe two per century. And so that makes things maybe a little bit more interesting for trying to come up with what these signals should look like for black supernovae. And this is just to say these two different ways of going about this are reasonably consistent. And then, of course, we know we can observe these things because we observe neutrinos from 1987A. So we, approve, uh, we observe about 20 neutrino events uh, from 1987A in two different detectors over a time scale of about 10 seconds. And with neutrino, or really, these are, uh, I think these are positron energies, and so with energies maybe from around 10 MeV up to 40 MeV or so. And observe the stuff. And both, most of these, were observed through this charged current channel of anti electron neutrinos on photons in water. So these are detected through these large water Trankov detectors. Uh, but we really only had a very small spatter, spattering of events from 1987. So this isn't uh, too discerning when you compare different models of proton neutron star formations. With larger, more modern detectors, and for uh, and 1987A also happened in the LMC, so that's a 50 kiloparsecs away, but the most likely distance from galactic supernova is like 10 kiloparsecs. So the combination of a closer galactic supernova and larger modern, detect modern detectors will, will give us thousands of events instead of the sort of 10 events that we saw in 1987A. And, and the other thing that's interesting, so here's just a listing of a bunch of different supernova, or a bunch of different neutrino detectors that have a star here because there are really no dedicated supernova neutrino detectors. These all have different day jobs, but most of them would detect would detect uh, neutrinos from any like profile supernova. And here are estimates of the number of events you would see from these things. So from super K for black and supernova, you would see 7,000 events. Uh, in ice cube, you would see like 10 to 6 events, but you wouldn't have single event separation. You would just have very, you would see some increase in the background because they're looking for much higher energy neutrinos. But there are quite a number of detectors that would see, you know, hundreds, one that would see thousands, and some near future and proposed detectors that would also see thousands. The other interesting thing here is that in 1987A, we probably only saw uh, electron anti neutrinos, but there are now detectors that have. Uh, different media, which can also detect electron neutrinos and heavy flavored neutrinos via neutral current scatter. So we'll have both flavor information, energy information, and time information on the signal. So there's going to be a lot of information coded in this signal about the properties of dense or about the properties of supporting neutron scatter. Okay, so that's sort of what how, how likely we are to detect these things what the sort of just the overall count rates we might get. And let's talk just a little bit about some, with some background about core collapse supernovae. I think most people have probably heard this, but just in case I'll give a, a quick review here. So we, we have, I think everyone knows that stars are more massive than uh, nine solar masses here. Between eight or nine solar masses burn their, or greater than nine solar masses burn their core all the way to iron. Slightly lighter mass stars might also undergo core collapse. Oxygen neon, neon supernovae. Um, so these things burn their core to iron. This thing builds up in the center and eventually uh, exceeds something like a Chandra Sekar mass. And when this happens, electron capture also starts to set in. And this thing starts to dynamically collapse in the interior and collapses down to very high densities until it reaches the nuclear saturation density, at which time the inner core stiffens and a bounce shock is formed. 
the shock propagates outwards uh, somewhat until it starts to associate iron and also starts to lose a lot of energy to neutrino emission once the shock gets outside of a region that's opaque to neutrinos. And so here I can show you just a, a one-dimensional simulation of core collapse. So on the x-axis is the radius, uh, and on the y-axis is the density in variance per femtometer cube. Uh, the electron fraction of this material is thing goes along. The neutrino luminosity, uh, the velocity is the black line, and the entropy is the red line. Here. So you see this thing uh, evolve along. It's the density of the cores increasing. There's more and more neutrino emissions occurring. You eventually have a neutrino traveling at some point, and then you have the shock breakout of those neutrinos that come out here. And this leaves behind some, uh, and during this whole period, you've lost a lot of uh, electron number from the lepton number from the core. And so you're left with this low body, relatively low body core that's still higher than what we have calibrated matter with predicts, so something like the one. And you are relatively low entropy, but you still have finite entropy. Then you have this somewhat higher entropy region here to which this supernova shock is high. And if you do this thing in 1D, you find what this model right here found is that you know, eventually by 600 milliseconds, the shock is at a very small radius, and it's just kind of sitting there, not much is happening. Uh, and it, eventually it's going to collapse to a black hole. So, but we know these things are really 3D, and this is really all I'm going to talk about these 3D simulations. And we know that behind the shock, you can get some amount of convection, uh, you can get things like the SASE occurring to, um, to maybe change how energy is transported in this thing and move more energy to the supernova shock. And so the idea here is, is that you might have some breaking of the spherical symmetry and might change what the dynamics are. And here are these, uh, here's a movie of the entropy of one of these 3D simulations that we recently run with 3D neutrino transport uh, and 3D hydrodynamics looking at the entropy in this region uh, to show you sort of what happened. So initially, this is just the shock front here. And each time this jumps, it's just, just the box is getting bigger. You can see initially it's very symmetric, similar to what this model I was showing you in the previous slide was. But, very, but maybe uh, 50 milliseconds in, you start to get all these convective instabilities behind the supernova shock. That makes things more favorable for an explosion for a variety of reasons. And if we run this through, we eventually get some sort of uh, explosion, we get some sort of shock run. So this is what I'm showing this panel up here, is that for uh, a wide array of models, although it depends on the resolution of your simulation, you can get some amount of shock run going on here, which likely implies that these things are going to explode. And you can look at that uh, during this period, the neutrino luminosity uh, is actually driven mostly by how you're accreting material through the shock from the outer layers of the star. And so you can see that the neutrino signal depends on what this accretion rate is here. So this, this accretion rate is shown by this dashed line. And as soon as the accretion slows down drastically, the neutrino luminosity falls off a little bit. And you can see that there's some evolution of the average energies of the neutrinos. And you have the standard early time hierarchy of um, less energetic uh, electron neutrinos and anti electron neutrinos than the heavy flavor. So that's great because we can do that in 3D, but you can't run that. You know, this model took about 60 million CPU hours to run for this period of time. So this is out to 3 or 50 milliseconds. And there's no way you're going to be able to use that to look at this tens of second long core collapse. Uh, I should just mention a brief aside for some of the lowest mass genders, you can, in fact, induce. Uh, an explosion in 1D. And this is because the progenitor structure is such that there's very little matter outside the inner core, and these things explode very early, so within maybe 100 milliseconds or so. Uh, and there, people have run models that go out to maybe 9 or 10 seconds. But this is only for a uh, very particular class of uh, core class supernovae, and the masses of proton neutron stars are left behind are very light, so they're much lighter than the 1.4 solar mass neutron stars you see. So given that we can't explode these things in 1D, we know they probably explode when we do this in multi-D. 
uh, we need to have some prescription if I want to evolve this thing for a long time in certain symmetry uh, to look at what happened to, to evolve the core and not form a black hole. And so for what I'm going to talk about today, I'm actually doing something very simple, but it gives me very, uh, it gives me control over what the mass of the proton neutron star is, which is one of its uh, largest controlling parameters of what the evolution looks like afterwards. So the remnant mass, and that's something that's uncertain for models <coughs> and for observations, so it really is in some sense a free parameter for this thing. So the general idea is, is that once the supernova shock has passed some uh, in total enclosed mass, which is just a fixed parameter, at that point I just remove the material outside and replace that with a boundary condition and remove the shock. And then you're left with the proton neutron star inside, and it's like it's somewhat like you've induced an explosion at a particular point. The, the drawback to this is that this causes somewhat abrupt end to accretion which is very different than what you would see in a real explosion where you have a uh, much briefer or, or, or period over which accretion ended. Uh, but that's really, I think it's really only going to leave uh, some impact on the signal for maybe 100 milliseconds. It's a relatively short period of time compared to what we want to look at for the proton neutron star core. And any other, any other mechanism that you use to artificially explode these stars <laughs> It's also going to leave behind some um, transient period where you maybe shouldn't believe exactly what the neutrino signals are. So th this, this is a nice procedure because it allows you to fix the remnant mass and look at how things depend on this remnant mass rather than it's on something that deals with generator structure or something. And so <clears throat> why is this late time neutrino signal, uh, neutrino emission interesting? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a somewhat simpler problem than the quark collapse phenomenon. I showed you this simulation where you have all this, convect, this, this instabilities going on, this asymmetry, uh, you have to do this all in 3D, all sorts of stuff, and it's very dynamical. Whereas the cooling of this remnant that's left there after the first 100 seconds is almost completely hydrostatic. And although there is some instability in this proton neutron star, which I'll talk about in a moment, it's uh, some hydrodynamic instabilities. Those are very efficient at mixing things, so things like mixing like theory work quite well. Uh, so really, at the end of the day, it just coupled neutron star structure and neutrino transport. So doing the neutrino transport well is important, but here, the very close spherical symmetry is a very good approximation, so you can do this in one view, and you can do this on, you know, maybe on this laptop or something, or maybe four of the top things there. But you can still do it on, you know, just a few cores. And it's also, there's not as much, not as much of a mess. And so it may be a cleaner probe of what's going on in, in dense matter in core probes. So I'm going to talk about uh, this late time emission, and I just want to show you here at the bottom that additionally, actually a large fraction of the energy comes out during this phase. So if you look at how much, what fraction of the total mining energy from the system is released, so from this right, from the light to the neutron star is released, during the collapse phase, which is maybe the first few hundred milliseconds, that's really maybe only 20 to 30 percent. And the majority of the energy release actually happens as this thing cools and contracts in a longer time span. So you actually get quite a large signal from this late time emission. And just, just to give you some idea uh, of what, what happens during this time, so I just want to show you some uh, the evolution of the radius of the thing as a function of enclosed mass and the density of the thing as a function of enclosed matter. So initially, you have this structure, so these, this, this color code is a function of time, so this is 25 milliseconds after uh, bounce in the supernova, and this is up to 70 seconds. So initially, you have the shock heated envelope that is at relatively low density compared to the homologous core, which didn't get shock heated and has this relatively low entropy, like I talked about before. Uh, and then as time goes on, this thing, especially the outer layers, contract, and but the interior also contracts over this period of time, although the dynamic range is as much. And you can see this also in looking at the radius as a function of time. So the radius of these outer layers very rapidly contracts until they come to something like that's it's not so extended to the sort of called mantle. Uh, the mantle is, eventually cools down and becomes very extended relative to the core. And then this whole thing. And, and over this process, basically, you're taking 
all this binding energy, from, taking this gravitational binding energy, turning it into neutrinos, and the, the total energy of it will result in something like three times the that's the point we can saw in the final reviews. So that's really what's powering the neutrino emission. And <clears throat> during this time, you're, you're, you can also look at this as a way of like you're losing uh, energy and entropy from this thing. So you're removing entropy from the core. And you can see that you have initially, you have these outer layers that were shot from you, they're high entropy. Those things cool off fairly rapidly. And you actually get some heating of the core, so you get some inward diffusion of joule heating in the core. And then the whole thing, uh, once you get the peak temperature, peak entropy in the core, then the whole thing cools as a whole. And during this whole period, you also have this high lepton number in the core, lower lepton number in the outer regions, and neutrinos can relatively easily escape. And then eventually, you have it all come down to like the beta equilibrium. And you can estimate the time scale for this kind of thing. It's from a simple diffusion argument, and you get something like tens of seconds. And so this whole process drives uh, a neutrino, you know, some neutrino signal from this thing. And so here I, I'm just going to show you, walk you through the anatomy of this core collapse supernova the neutrino signal. And so here I'm just showing you neutrino luminosity as a function of time. On uh, well, at early times, it's a linear scale right here, but then it, Transitions to being a logarithmic scale on the uh, x axis. That just allows you to see this shock breakout here. Uh, there, I'm showing you the three flavors of neutrinos that I evolved so electron neutrinos, electron anti neutrinos, and heavy flavored neutrinos. So we just put all the heavy flavored neutrinos together for basically for computational efficiency. There should be a slight difference between the anti or the anti and the neutrinos and the mid time neutrinos, but that's generally quite small. Uh, and then on the second panel, I'm showing you the average energies of the emitted neutrino. And so you can see this early time phase when you're dominated by the electron neutrinos, and that's when the core is being leptonized during collapse, so you're losing a lot of electron number. Uh, then you see this little notch sitting here, which is when, you, when neutrinos become trapped and the neutrino spheres get pulled in. So you see this slight reduction in the amount of electron neutrinos. And then you see, when, like in this movie I showed before, there's this point where the shock breaks out of the neutrino spheres, and you see this spike in the uh, electron neutrino fluxes. And so this is uh, the electronization burst, that's a very distinct signal, and this is something that sort of comes from more early time stuff. And you can see at this time, the other two flavors of neutrinos, their luminosities are rising now, and they're no longer dominated by electron capture. And then you have this period where the supernova hasn't exploded yet. You have some accretion. The luminosity here is dominated by this, uh, what's going on in the accretion flow. And that's what I showed you from this 3D model that I had before. And you can see here in this time that the spectra hardens. So there's this uh, generic increase in all flavors of neutrinos as a function of time. Uh, and then this little point here is where I perform this mass cut, so basically induce an explosion. And then you can see this period where you have a somewhat more rapid fall off in neutrino luminosity. And this is the period over <coughs> the mantle I showed you before, it's contracting inward. And so this can be somewhat sensitive to exactly what the explosion mechanism is and how, how accretion ends. But once that mantle cooling is ended, and that's within the first second here. You see that there's this long, uh, long period of core cooling, where you see that neutrino flavors have very similar luminosities, and over time, their average energies are converging on one another. And then, eventually, at the very latest times, you see this very rapid drop off, and that is when the neutrino, when the neutrino spheres start to, so the emission surfaces of the neutrinos, when they start to contract into the proto-neutron star, and so then you get, you know, because you have this r squared times t to the fourth dependence of luminosity, you see a rapid reduction in what the um, neutrino luminosity is. And you also see some turnover in average energy. And so you can see that uh, here, I'm just plotting the, the radius of the neutrino spheres. And you can see that at early times, if it goes out to larger radii, you get some neutrino trapping, where you see this little dip uh, here. They're at quite large radii when during the accretion phase. They contract the mantle, they sit. 
that sort of surface of the neutron star for quite a while and converge, and then eventually the thing becomes cooled up, the thing cools off, the neutrino energies get lower, the generation kicks in, and the neutrino spheres uh, retract to the center of the star, and eventually you have no neutrino sphere, and you're just emitting from this thing uh, lots and lots of neutrinos without them rescattering on their own. And over this time, you can look at also what the core does. So this is the, the central entropy is the, this uh, sort of solid line here. And you can see where you've got that entropy repeating that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and you can also see how this thing de -leptonizes. So you can see that there's some period over which the leptonization occurs. So this is the total lepton number, this is the electron lepton number, and you want to think of the end of leptonization from those two things. And then eventually you come to the values that you would expect for data uh, equilibrium. And so the, the question becomes, okay, how, how we know what this neutrino signal looks like now, so how late can we detect these things? So you know, are, are we likely to be able to detect? You know, could we even detect these neutrinos after on the tail? The luminosity is very low, so the, the answer there is probably no. But if you look at what the detection rates, so this is uh, from a project that I'm working on Shirley Lee, which is taking these models and looking at detection rates and number of detectors. Uh, and you can see that this is the reverse cumulative count rate. So after, in the time after, let's say, uh, 50 seconds or so, you might only see one event. But before that, you're going to see quite a number of events over this time, maybe 10 seconds after that. So you can see maybe, let's say, 100 events about this cooling period. And uh, that, of course, depends on the distance you're assuming all sorts of things, but you can get a pretty good spectrum over this integrated time and things that are maybe going to let you uh, give you some discernment between different models for this. Uh, so now let me talk about a few different things that can, that can impact uh, the structure of the signal. So maybe the most obvious one uh, that you might think of is, okay, well, if I have a different progenitor star, so I've got different initial conditions for my core collapse, and that, I might expect that my proto-neutron star evolves quite differently. Uh, and so what I'm showing you here is two different models. So one for a 15 solar mass star and one for a 40 solar mass star. Uh, yeah. uh, and so you can see, and I assume that they both end up with the same remnant mass, which is probably not true with them. But it's, uh, it's a way of looking at how much this really depends on progenitor structure versus how much it depends on what the remnant mass ends up being. And so the idea is I cut these both off once they get to 1.5 solar masses, and then I watch them fall. And you can see that you know, during this early time mantle contraction phase, they look somewhat different, the leptonization rate looks different here. But very soon, within the first second, they relax and have almost the exact same evolution of the neutrino mass. And you can see that Okay, well, they have slightly different lepton numbers in the core. Their evolution occurs on almost exactly the same time scale. And they get the same value. Oh, sorry, I said 1.5 is really 1.6 uh, solar masses for the photo neutron star. And so, okay, this is actually relatively easier to, to understand. And that it's essentially because what's really setting this, what's going on here, is the properties of this inner core. So, what's the lepton number? What's the lepton fraction? How, how large is the smallest core? And if you collapse a lot of stars, uh, that what this interior structure is actually relatively insensitive to progenitor structure. So this is, we pointed out for, for a while, and Chris has done some nice work on this recently, uh, looking at how, how much really is looking at these electron capture rate variations. But you look at quite a number of progenitors, and you see that there's actually very small variation in the core properties with progenitor mass. <coughs> And you, you, if you looked at what the homologous core mass is, so this region where you get this, that's not shocked, that also depends fairly deeply. So really, these things are pretty independent of progenitor structure for a fixed proto-neutron star mass. So a second thing that can impact um, the neutrino signal is convection inside of this proto-neutron star. So you might have noticed that, especially the outer layers that are shock heated, because they're cooling on the outer, at, at the outer edge and they're not as efficiently cooling the interior because the neutrinos are trapped, you end up with some negative entropy gradient there and you also end up with some negative uh, lepton. 
And so if you just look at this thing by the, the new criterion, you find that the outer layers of this thing uh, are in state. And that depends both, like I was just saying, on the entropy gradients, the lepton number gradients, so this is just the new, the new criterion, so this is doing by the, the, the instability. Uh, and so if this number is greater than zero, then you expect this thing is unstable. And here you find that it depends on these gradients, and it also depends on the equation states. And here there's pressure with respect to entropy, pressure with respect to the wet time. And if you look at uh, a particular model for this, you find that you can get some convectiveness. So this is a given hand diagram for the region of convectiveness of all this. It's showing you the closed area number on this axis versus time here. And so you can see that the outer regions are convectively unstable early times. But convection, at least for this particular model, eats its way into the core by maybe five seconds and evolve and stays growing near the surface until maybe 10 seconds, at which time it sort of ends throughout most of the summer. And then you expect that you're just going to have this diffusive cooling, diffusive neutrino cooling. And here, here's just a 3D model of uh, a snapshot of this convection. And so if we look at how this, this convection impacts the, the neutrino signal of these things, uh, you can see a couple of different impacts. So in the black models here, there's no convection. In the red models, there's convection. Aside from that, everything is exactly the same. We use a mixing length theory prescription for convection here because this is spherically symmetric. Uh, but if you look at how sensitive the convection is to changing the mixing length parameters, or you compare it to multiple simulations, you get almost no difference when you vary all these different parameters. And that's because it, the reason is it's just the convection is very efficient. And so it just erases all the gradients very rapidly. So it's, it's actually a pretty good approximation here. And you can see that during this cooling phase when convection is going on, so at the early times when you saw this given hand diagram, your convection is more efficiently transporting energy in lepton number. It's heating up the surface. These proton neutrons are because you're getting more energy out more rapidly. And you can see that there's some increase in luminosity. And when convection ends, you see a sharp drop in the luminosity because you're no longer efficiently moving energy up. And then you see this cooling tail <coughs> where you're dominated by diffusive cooling. And if you look at the average energies, you see something that's somewhat analogous. You see that because convection heats up the outer layers, you see that you push up the average energies relative to the model with no convection. But once convection ceases, those energies are slightly low. And these differences are, are somewhat small. They can be important to nuclear synthesis, which I'll talk about maybe at the end of this, uh, but they're probably not going to make too much of a difference in detection rates. This, on the other hand, is a lot of dex on this axis, so that small difference actually can make a significant difference to uh, the detection rates. Uh, and you can see that this also, the convection also changes what happens in the interior of the star, so uh, that you see this much more rapid evolution and much more maximum entropy in the core. Uh, and you also see a much more rapid rate of electronization. Uh, and one interesting aspect of convection of these things, as I pointed out in the Duke criterion before, uh, it depends on what these derivatives of the pressure with respect to entropy and lepton number are. And those, especially the derivative with respect to lepton number, are sensitive to properties in the nuclear fission state. And this is something that's happening at fairly high density, so I showed you that it extends to this whole proton neutron star. Uh, and so, in this case, changing the symmetry energy, uh, so changing the equation of state and changes the pressure derivative. And, and the main thing that impacts this, and so how the pressure changes with, with YL, is the derivative of the symmetry energy, although uh, there's some uh, contribution from electrons. Basically, the derivative of the symmetry energy is telling you something about how the pressure the derivative of the energy is either something like pressure and the derivative of, of the symmetry energy, which is the difference between symmetric nuclear matter and pure neutron matter, the energy of symmetric nuclear matter and pure neutron matter, uh, works together to give you this contribution from the derivative of the symmetry. So if you change that in the equation of state, so here's the symmetry energy as a function of density, or two different equations of state rather extreme. Uh, and you can see that the derivative is very different for these two things, especially uh, at supersaturation density. And so that's maybe going to change how this convective instability evolves. And so that's going to maybe tell you something about symmetry energy. 
And so if you, if you run a few different models uh, with different equations of uh, proton neutron circle with different nuclear equations of state, and you look at how, how this goes, as you change the symmetry, the derivative of the symmetry energy, so if it's larger, it actually gets earlier. And so you see this, this break in the light curve at earlier times. Uh, and then if you have a uh, smaller derivative, it goes to later times. And if you look at the ratio of count rates at early times and late times, you can actually see very strong separations. And this is just the ratio of count rates from 2 to 10 seconds to a few milliseconds to infinity. Uh, these are basically just normalized count rates from 100 milliseconds to a second versus 3 seconds. And so you can see that you can actually differentiate between these two different uh, derivatives and symmetry. Although there are other things that are going to go this, so maybe it's not as, as clean and uh, separable as I'm showing here, but at least there's going to be some impact of the symmetry energy density dependence on the neutrino signal. Uh, another thing that can strongly impact what the cooling time scale looks like, and so it might be able to tell us something about. Uh, what's going on inside this proton neutron star is neutrino opacity. So you, know, you usually think of neutrino interactions as being something that are fairly well characterized. You know them from the standard model. But the thing to take into account here is these neutrinos aren't interacting with free neutrons and protons. They're interacting with neutrons and protons in a dense medium, which are interacting with other neutrons and protons. You can have some correlations that impact what these opacities are. You can just the degeneracy of the medium impacts these opacities. Uh, Mean field corrections can change things. So there, are a lot, there are a lot of ways that a lot of things that we really don't know about neutrino opacities inside the proton neutron star. And so, given models for nuclear matter, you can model what these opacities are, but you also require some you know, particular many body methods to take, into, take these things into account. And so, here I'm just looking at really just to illustrate how this can change things, maybe the simplest case. So, if I take what the uh, response of the nuclear medium to a weak probe is, so this is just the nuclear response, it doesn't really matter, it's just that the, the cross section is going to be proportional to this thing. Uh, and I just take the, what it should be for a free uh, Boltzmann gas. I just find that it's proportional to the number density of nuclear. And if I run a model like that, I see that I have this cooling tail that extends out past 100 seconds, and this thing never becomes awkward in this model. But if I take into account the fact that these things are even the you know, simplest, simplest correction, where I assume that these things are um, fermions, so the nucleons are fermions, and they can become degenerate. I, instead, I'm really scattering from the Fermi surface or something like the width, the thermal width of the Fermi surface. And so as time goes on, the temperature goes down, this becomes much smaller, uh, this derivative of number density with respect to the chemical potential divided by the temperature. Uh, it becomes much, much smaller than the total number density. And so eventually you see this thing turn over because the neutrino opacities have not been reduced. So changes in the opacities really can change the cooling behavior, and especially at these late times. Uh, maybe one of the most obvious things to look at is how does something like nuclear correlations or screening of nucleons in the medium impact things? So you can do this through the, looking at things like the random phase approximation. So it's just basically this summation of bubble diagrams, and it gives you basically a screening of the weak charge in the medium. And if you look at the calculations, look at how this changes uh, neutrino diffusion coefficients, so it's essentially how rapidly you can get neutrinos out of this proton neutron star. If I, if I look at how the ratio of the diffusion coefficients when I include these correlations to when I don't include these correlations, you find that you actually strongly suppress the cross sections to enhance the fusion coefficients because suppressing the neutrino cross sections allows neutrinos to get out faster. And you see that you get maybe a factor of maybe a four change in what the rate of neutrino loss is. So that's likely to, and these are just for four different diffusion coefficients. It doesn't matter. So these are all four to four. Um, so you can see that this can potentially impact the neutrino opacities quite a bit. And if you include these things in models of proton neutron star cooling, you can see that, okay, so here in the base model, there's uh, none of these RPA corrections, no convection is included. If I just include the RPA uh, corrections, the opacities for one particular model of the nuclear equation state, I see that I, I speed up cooling because I've uh, 
I've reduced the opacity so I get neutrinos out much more rapidly. And then, then I go to this optical thin phase earlier because I have some totally out of energy I need. If I include convection, then, then I see almost no difference during the period when convection is acting. So convection is much more efficient than moving energy and electron number around than uh, neutrino diffusion is. But then once convection ceases and I'm dominated by neutrino diffusion, I see that my time scale of the schooling tail is quite a bit different. And so this thing is observable, so looking at the time scale of this thing, might tell you something about um, what the opacities are inside this plane of neutrino scale. Uh, and I, like I said, this is just for one particular model uh, for the underlying interaction that goes into these calculations. And so if I, if I, ch if I vary the interaction, uh, in particular the axial channels in the spin channel, I can see that, and this is not very well constrained, which is, uh, maybe it is, but I definitely haven't seen the constraints on it. You can vary the strength of this interaction, and you can change significantly what the cooling time scale is. So by Increasing the strength of this interaction, you basically move to cooling, uh, becoming optical thing at lower times and just speed up the cooling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. So this, this is the old model, and here it's getting to a point where the equilibrium flux level diffusion breaks down because it's just kind of optical thing. So you probably should have it. Um, okay, so that's what I want to say about uh, varying time scales. I have uh, a few minutes left here, so uh, I think I'll continue on, even though I'm supposed to be 10 minutes again. Uh, and talk a little bit more about, okay, so I've been just talking about what impacts the time scale of the neutrino signal, what impacts the velocities, but there's sort of maybe this second order question of what, what happens to the neutrino spectrum? So what are the average energies of the neutrinos that are emitted? What's the distribution of these energies and uh, what's going on there? So, what, what the first question becomes what, what determines the neutrino spectrum? And so, the neutrino luminosities can be determined deep in the core because they're sort of telling you how efficiently am I pushing the total neutrino number through this thing, how am I pushing the total electron number, but what the final spectrum is really going to be determined by the properties at the exterior of this proton neutron star where the neutrinos are eventually emitted. The, eventually come to us and actually need. And so this is what you would call the neutrino sphere range. And because the neutrino interactions are rather energy dependent, there's actually a range of neutrino spheres for different neutrino energies. Uh, and where this decoupling happens depends strongly on both neutral current rates and then for electron and anti-electron neutrinos from charged current rates. And so one thing that's going to be of interest, and I'll talk in a couple slides, I'll talk about this more, there's going to be a difference between the electron neutrino spectrum and anti electron neutrino spectrum. So, this is going to be important for um, the synthesis. And one thing that's going to be very different for these two things is what, is, what are the charge current rates here? Because the electron neutrinos uh, interact with neutrons in the medium, whereas the anti electron neutrinos have to undergo charge current interaction with photons in the medium. And so, we know that these things have very low. Electron fraction in the outer layers, so there are a lot more neutrons than photons. And so we expect some asymmetry between these things. Of course, there's a lot of degenerate electrons, so that slows down this reaction. But this is a source of asymmetry between these two types of neutrinos. Uh, and here's just sort of an illustration. So this is sort of an illustration of what the neutrino sphere looks like. So you have these neutrinos in thermal equilibrium, the surface last scattering is here, and then they transition. And this happens over this, the neutrino spheres sit over a range of temperatures and densities. So they go from maybe 10 MeV at low energy all the way down to maybe 3 or 4 MeV at very high energy. So the higher the energy of the neutrinos, the farther out they decouple because they're larger cross sections. And decoupling happens over quite a large range of densities. But some of these densities, especially the lower energy neutrinos, can be quite high. So you might expect that nuclear reactions might be some. Uh, and they decouple over the relatively low YE part of the neutron star. And so, like I said a second ago, the reason these things, are, uh, this difference is interesting uh, between these, these neutrino spectra is that they impact what the, um, what the composition of the innermost layers of this core collapse supernova are. 
And so you have the proton neutron star sitting here and deposit a bunch of energy as the neutrinos go out. And that's actually enough to unbind a little bit of material from the surface of this thing and drive a wind <coughs> that comes off. And this wind uh, is interesting because you have maybe 10 or 12 neutrino interactions per baryon that comes out of this potential well. And those are all almost all charge current interactions. And so those turn protons into neutrons and neutrons into protons. And you can get away from having uh, symmetric nuclear matter here. And you can also get reasonably high entropies. And so it's a place that you can maybe, when you when these things, when this wind undergoes some charge particle reactions and cools off, and maybe undergoes some neutron capture, some proton capture, you can maybe make some uh, interesting nuclei here. And so, but what's going to be a, the most important thing that's going to happen that determines nucleosynthesis is whether or not you have more neutrons than protons or more protons than neutrons. And that's going to be very dependent on what these neutrino spectra are coming from. The and here, once again, is a place where uh, neutrino interaction rates uh, in the medium can play a rather large role. And also, once again, it's going to depend on the symmetry. And so the idea here is that. Basically, the cross section is proportional to the phase space available for the final state of electron. And if I have a nucleon in my medium that has, uh, it picks up some uh, maybe mean field uh, potential or some self energy, but there's basically some potential energy offset in the energy in addition to this kinetic term that's sitting here. And so, in neutron rich matter, this potential is larger for the neutrons. And so you can see that there's some uh, much lot, so larger than the neutrons. And when I turn a neutron into a proton, uh, I get this very large energy difference between uh, potential energy of neutrons and potential energy of protons. I get that out in the final state of electron. So that energy difference conserve momentum because the masses of the nucleons here are quite large. To conserve momentum here, I need to transfer that energy, that energy difference. And so I get a much more energetic final state of electron. In the opposite case, where I have an anti-electron neutrino capture on uh, a proton going to a positron plus a neutron, I actually lose a lot of neutrino energy. Uh, or, yeah, lose a lot of energy in this final state of that And so, uh, you know, without any final state of that this left front phase space is basically just proportional to the energies. So that's going to tell you that I'm going to make these rates asymmetric. So that I'm going to increase the cross section for. Uh, neutrino capture and decrease the cross section of anti electron neutrino capture. And then when I take into account that I have electrons floating around the medium, these things uh, are, are fairly highly degenerate, although it's, there's finite temperature. So increasing the energy of the final state electron actually gives you an exponential increase because you're moving uh, closer and closer to the Fermi surface. And because it has some finite width, width and temperature, you get exponentially less water. And so now including these corrections into your, your models for the proton neutron star, you find that you can shift, especially for the electron neutrinos, you can shift the energies and things quite a bit by a few MeV. And this also has some impact on what the deluxization rate is, which is also a thing to what the uh, electron fraction of these neutrino driven is. And if I look at how the electron fraction of the neutrino driven wind evolves with and without these. Uh, interactions, I find that without the interactions, the cross sections are quite similar. And so that means that the average energies of electron neutrinos and electron anti neutrinos are quite similar. So there's a more or less equal number of captures. And I get something that has an electron fraction that's above, a little bit above 0.5. And things are quite symmetric. But when I increase the electron neutrino cross sections and decrease the electron anti neutrino cross section, I move the neutrino spheres apart. And so the anti-electron neutrino sphere goes inward, the electron neutrino sphere goes outward, and so then if there's hotter temperature at this inner neutrino sphere than the outer neutrino sphere, and so I make the anti-electron neutrinos a little bit hotter and the electron neutrinos significantly cooler, like I just showed you in this slide here. And what that tends to do is mean that I have more captures on protons than I do on neutrons, and I reduce the electron fraction, and I end up with neutron rich alpha. And that, at least in the simplest scenario, can make a big difference in the nuclear synthesis you get in this wind. So you, in this case, you maybe make neutron-rich conditions 
to make this n equals 50 nuclei, whereas when you have proton rich conditions, you make very little in this particular model that I'm showing here, although there's some where you can make the undergo a new key process and make some interesting things. But the, the point is, is what nucleosynthesis you get here is actually going to be very sensitive to what your neutrino opacities are. And once again, this is something that depends on the symmetry energy. So this potential difference is basically a manifestation of the symmetry energy. So if you have a larger symmetry energy, you get a larger potential difference, and that makes this separation greater. And so in cases where but it's low density symmetry energy that matters, so the low saturation density, like I showed you, the, uh, the neutrino spheres are at rather low densities. And so shifting. Uh, what the symmetry energy is can change what the interaction is. So these calculations do not include convection. Yes. And so uh, that leads up to what I want to talk about. <laughs> uh, and so very recently, Ritzi, you know, really this is uh, Thomas Junker's group who done these calculations. This is a big review paper that a bunch of authors on. So recently, they've done these calculations, including convection. And they see that they get this very large increase in value. And so the reason, the reason you might think this happens is because convection uh, as a function of time is small. So the reason that I think that they, they see this is because you get some increased uh, deleptimization rate from convection. And that means that you have significantly more electron neutrinos than electron anti neutrinos. So that makes things worse. Uh, but those are quite large increases in YE. And so if I take what my model is given me, and I just look at uh, maybe a somewhat simpler approximation to what the YE of this wind is, but nonetheless uh, reasonably accurate, I actually find that including convection reduces YE. So that this is relatively primary, but there are two things that impact this. There's the number of neutrinos that are coming out. And so convection increases those numbers. Uh, the relative number of electron neutrinos and anti electron neutrinos. But I also showed you that convection increases the average energies of the neutrinos. And so you have to overcome, uh, in these reactions, you have to overcome the neutron proton rest mass difference. And so as you go to higher, so if you had exactly the same spectrum of electron neutrinos and electron anti neutrinos, you would wind up with a YE that's a little bit above 0.5. But for, uh, for any average energy. But the larger the average energy the neutrinos are relative to the mass difference, the less impact that mass difference has on the one. And so, in fact, here I think what we're seeing is that at early times you have a reduction in YE because the average energies are, are higher relative to this um, difference in the proton neutron mass. Difference. And we are seeing an increased electrolyzation rate, but that, that's overcome by this higher average energy. So I would say that the, uh, and this is the model we have in, in the field stuff here. So I, I would say that, at least from my perspective, the jury's still out on what impact reduction has on the line of the uh, So that was really all I wanted to talk about today. Uh, so I, just some various conclusions. I told you about how sensitive this was to gender structure. Uh, and I told you it was not very sensitive. Uh, and I talked about proton neutron star convection uh, and how this convection might be sensitive to the nuclear equation of state. Uh, I also talked about how neutrino opacities might impact the cooling time scale, in particular, um, these correlations or screening through the RPA. Uh, there's many things you could do beyond that, but that's maybe the simplest approximation you can make. Uh, and in particular, these things lead to fail, especially at late times, where you can still observe these things. Um, from a galactic nuclear And then I talked at the very end cell about how these neutrinos can impact nuclear synthesis. So thanks. How is it the sensitivity Um, you're talking about for the convection or for the. No, I, I think we're sensitive to it for the pre-wide 
You're talking about the Houston curves? Oh, which curves? There, yeah. Oh, no, that one. That was in the high school. This one? Yeah, sorry, this, I, should, I probably should do this relative to the center. No, but I can't do that. I thought I saw this one. Crossing was supposed to be one line. It's the same. It's, I, I showed this plot twice just in different contexts. It's the same plot. I'm not sure you can do it. So. I think if you look at one of these um, chirally T calculations and other things are shown in the experimental constraints are these these two sort of bracket what you might expect for the symmetry. I just wonder if, uh, if you brought the low density region or the neutrinos that if you have a problem in the initial finite state, it's likely to be some fair uh, state. Yeah, so I, I, people have started to look at what clusters might do in this in this scenario. I think that's that's an interesting question. To be fair, though, it's relatively hot, so the temperatures are like three five hundred degrees. So clustering is maybe less likely. But I think I think it's definitely an interesting question. Three hundred degrees is all. Well, I, I mean, the, yeah, I think I think it's worth it to discuss it. Um, but people have done some exploratory calculations and claim it's not that sensitive, but you know, the level at which they're, the accuracy at which they're doing it is low. Okay. But the question of clustering, of course, for that, it just really was the neutrino uh, cross section on clustering. Yeah, it, you could, it could also matter if you form a cluster in the final state and you get that extra kind of energy out. It had the same in general, cluster is in, 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 uh, in the initial state, yeah. But going to the final state, if you get that final energy out, then it can transfer to the much higher. So, would we detect neutrinos from an M31 complex supernova? You need to detect one. If they are, it would be worse than that. Maybe you would say you second something in terms of looking at um, <clears throat> you know, anything beyond that. It's not, it's not so, how sensitive are you to the next step of the same generator? Is it all equal? How does that relation change? If, if you change the point of your transfer mass, yeah. yeah. I mean, so you, you know, the total energy you get out, obviously, it just depends on what the, the binding energy difference is. You get, you get a longer evolution if you change the mass cut mass. But that, that's something you maybe if you can get some volumetric estimates of the neutrinos that are coming out. That's maybe a primary that's most easily constrained in the neutrinos. Anything else? Thank you.